rest of society. However, in reality, wolves are pack animals. They work together exploring, hunting, and killing as a group. This is the type of animal that God has chosen to convey the image of the enemy slipping into the church unaware, an enemy intent on bringing doom to the flock, who does so while wearing a disguise. Matthew 7.15 Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. If you look for the lone wolf, you may never spot him. However, once you understand the tactics of the pack, of which he is secretly a member, then his camouflage vanishes. Today we are going to expose the wolf pack. Before that great light, which is Jesus Christ, mercifully shined his grace upon me, I could only see the darkness in this world. I saw it and I studied it. In fact, the Lord used this understanding to draw me to him. You see, even the darkness testifies of the light when you uncover that which the darkness attempts to conceal. The cult symbols, activities, and beliefs are thoroughly indoctrinated into our society. The threads of a Luciferian corruption are woven throughout various belief systems and practices, ultimately forming the basis of a wicked religion. Unsurprisingly, the enemy works tirelessly to try to knead this leaven into the dough that is our bread of life. And a little leaven leavened at the whole lump. Galatians 5.9 Today we are going to unmask the ravening wolf. We are going to rip away his wool coat, leaving an exposed and desolate. Ephesians 5.11 Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. I am going to teach you basic core concepts of the enemy so you can understand the corrupt foundation on which the wolves stand. I show you this so you can recognize when they bring this poison doctrine into the church and oppose them. Today we fulfill 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. And Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beloved, guard yourselves to not be intrigued by what I am about to show you. Put on the full armor of God. We do not venture into the darkness to chase after the shadows, but to shine a light on them, reprove them, and to vanquish them. I am only going to show you what I must in order to expose the wolf's mind, so that you can gain the advantage and skin the beast. Take up the shield of faith and the sword of the Lord, which is his word, and we will venture into the heart of the wolf den and remove their cover. There are a number of ancient practices and beliefs tied together by a serpentine knot. These schools of thought are practiced in the secret societies to this day and are woven into the fabric of society. Like hypnosis, these teachings from the enemy impact the beliefs and philosophies of all those not covered in the blood of the Lamb. Let's overview these belief systems and expose the Antichrist leaven which they espouse. Then we will connect all the dots, giving us a complete picture of the wolf and allowing us to expose specific examples of when they've slipped into the church. We will begin our journey with a look at Hermeticism. In the annals of human history, there exists a tradition veiled in mystery, yet profoundly influential in shaping the currents of Western thought. Welcome to the enigmatic world of Hermeticism. Hermeticism traces its origins to the fertile lands of ancient Egypt, where the god Thoth, known as Hermes Trismegistus, is said to have imparted his divine wisdom to humanity. This tradition, 
blending elements of mysticism, philosophy, and magic, has endured through the ages, leaving an indelible mark on the tapestry of human spirituality. What sets Hermeticism apart is its emphasis on the pursuit of knowledge and spiritual enlightenment through the exploration of the cosmos and the self. Its adherents seek to unlock the secrets of the universe, believing that the microcosm of the individual reflects the macrocosm of the cosmos. From the alchemical laboratories of medieval Europe to the esoteric societies of the Renaissance, Hermeticism has captivated the minds of seekers and scholars alike. Notable figures such as Giordano Bruno, Paracelsus, and Isaac Newton were drawn to its teachings, seeking to unravel the mysteries of existence. At the heart of Hermetic philosophy lies the principle of as above, so below, suggesting a correspondence between the celestial and terrestrial realms. This notion underscores the interconnectedness of all things, affirming the inherent divinity within each individual. Hermeticism espouses the idea that humanity shares in the divine nature, possessing the potential for spiritual evolution and enlightenment. Unlike the rigid dogmas of mainstream religions, Hermeticism embraces the notion of personal transformation and growth, recognizing that there are many paths to enlightenment. Unlike the dualistic worldview of some religious traditions, Hermeticism rejects the notion of a strict dichotomy between good and evil. Instead, it acknowledges the inherent ambiguity of moral principles, advocating for a nuanced understanding of ethics. In Hermetic thought, God is not bound by human conceptions of morality or limitation. Rather, the divine is seen as transcendent and ineffable, beyond the constraints of human comprehension. Furthermore, Hermeticism challenges the notion of divine judgment and eternal damnation, proposing instead a universe governed by cosmic laws and the principle of karma. As we journey through the labyrinthine corridors of Hermeticism, we are reminded of the perennial quest for truth and wisdom that transcends the boundaries of time and space. In a world shrouded in uncertainty, perhaps the teachings of Hermes Trismegistus offer a beacon of light amidst the darkness. Or rather, it's a beacon of false light. Let's see how you did at detecting the Antichrist leaven. There is a lot to unpack. There was its use of mysticism, philosophy, and magic, the pursuit of hidden and forbidden knowledge, the principle of as above, so below, which we also see reflected in the satanic Baphomet. We saw the many paths deception while we know that Jesus Christ is the only path. Did you catch the ambiguous morality? Everything is a shade of gray, where good can be evil and evil can be good. The scriptures read in Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You may have also caught the part about no judgment and hell. Keep these items in mind as we explore a couple more Western esoteric traditions. At the conclusion, we will have a base of knowledge to show you the key concepts of leaven that the enemy seeks to mix with our precious gospel. It is different than what most expect. Next up is a quick look at Kabbalah. Deep within the rich tapestry of Jewish mysticism lies a tradition both ancient and profound. Welcome to the mystical realm of Kabbalah. Originating in the esoteric teachings of the Jewish faith, Kabbalah is a path of spiritual inquiry and contemplation that seeks to unveil the hidden truths of existence. Its roots can be traced back to the dawn of Jewish civilization, where sages and mystics delved into the mysteries of the divine. What sets Kabbalah apart is its emphasis on the inner dimensions of Torah, the sacred text of Judaism. Through the study of symbols, numerology, and meditation, Kabbalists seek to forge a deeper connection with the divine and unlock the secrets of creation. Notable figures such as Isaac Luria, Moses de Leon, 
and the Baal Shem Tov were drawn to its mystical teachings, leaving an indelible mark on Jewish spirituality. At the heart of Kabbalistic thought lies the notion of Ein Sof, the infinite and unknowable essence of God. From this boundless source emanate the ten sephirot, or divine attributes, through which the universe is created and sustained. Kabbalah teaches that humanity shares in the divine nature, possessing a spark of the divine within each soul. Unlike the anthropomorphic depiction of God in some religious traditions, Kabbalah emphasizes the transcendent and ineffable nature of the divine, beyond human comprehension. In Kabbalistic thought, the universe is governed by the principle of tikkun, or spiritual repair, wherein each individual plays a role in the ongoing evolution of creation. This concept underscores the interconnectedness of all beings and the responsibility to act with compassion and righteousness. Unlike the concept of eternal damnation in certain religious doctrines, Kabbalah posits a universe governed by divine justice and mercy. Rather than punishment, the focus is on spiritual growth and transformation. This was a good second video to review because the leaven was more subtle. Because of this tradition's ties to Judaism, some of the concepts seem familiar and are acceptable. For instance, the reference at the end to God's divine justice and mercy. That is an accurate description of our Father. However, His divine justice required the spilling of His Son's blood and the separation of sheep from goats. The devil was in the details. Titus 1.13-14 reads, This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not given heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, that turn from the truth. Let's review some of the main points we just heard. Kabbalah, like Hermeticism, focuses on the pursuit of secret knowledge for the purpose of self-evolution. Isaiah 45, 19-21 reads, I have not spoken in secret, in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Followers of Kabbalah believe in a universe created and sustained not through God, but through ten attributes, thus putting the force of the Creator above the Creator Himself. They also see this force of God as impersonal rather than as our Father. Furthermore, Kabbalah sees humans as playing a role in creation, despicably putting us on a more even plane with God and feeding into all kinds of little gods leaven. Finally, again, we see the absence of judgment in hell, hearkening back to the lie of the serpent in the garden who hissed, You will not surely die. Buckle up as we next cover Gnosticism before we directly address the leaven that is seeped into the church. In the shadowed corridors of ancient wisdom, there exists a tradition both enigmatic and profound. This is the mystical world of Gnosticism. Emerging in the early centuries, Gnosticism represents a diverse array of mystical teachings and spiritual practices. Its origins shrouded in mystery, Gnosticism flourished alongside early Christianity, offering seekers an alternative path to enlightenment. What sets Gnosticism apart is its emphasis on gnosis, or direct experiential knowledge of the divine. Rejecting the dogmas and hierarchies of conventional religion, Gnostics sought to transcend the material world and commune with the ineffable. At the heart of Gnostic philosophy lies the notion of the divine spark within each individual. In contrast to the doctrines of original sin and redemption found in Christianity, Gnosticism teaches that humanity possesses a divine essence trapped within the confines of the material world. Gnosticism emphasizes the inherent divinity of humanity, teaching that salvation comes through the awakening of the divine spark within. Unlike the omnipotent and omniscient God of mainstream Christianity, Gnosticism portrays the divine as transcendent and unknowable, beyond human comprehension. In Gnostic cosmology, the material world is often depicted 
as a realm of illusion and suffering governed by archons or malevolent cosmic forces. Salvation is achieved through enlightenment and liberation from the constraints of the physical realm. Gnostics believe the created material world is evil and therefore in opposition to the world of the spirit and that only the spirit is good. Adherents of Gnosticism often constructed an evil lesser god and beings of the Old Testament to explain the creation of the world and considered Jesus Christ a holy spiritual god who did not come in the flesh but who only came in a spiritual body. Gnostic beliefs clashed strongly with accepted Christian doctrine, causing early church leaders to be embroiled in heated debates over the issues. By the end of the second century, many Gnostics broke away or were expelled from the church. They formed alternative churches with belief systems deemed heretical by the Christian church. Gnosticism is a good one to close on because it attempts to parallel Christianity and thus allows for the most effective leaven. Notice the Gnostic belief that Christ did come down to us and they even recognize him as God. However, they deny that he came in the flesh. They also attempt to separate Christ from the God of creation, instead vilifying physical creation and attributing it to a wicked lesser God. Cultists refer to our father in a disrespectful way, calling him the Demurge. We see this leaven today with many Christians ignoring the Old Testament altogether, or sometimes even claiming it's a different God. Even among faithful adherents, one can oftentimes hear Christians today making the baffling statement, the God of the Old Testament, is if there were more than one God. Another piece of leaven is the alternative path approach of Gnostics who believe that they can obtain salvation through carnal knowledge. You may have also noticed that in contrast to sin and redemption, they believe humans have the divine essence. This speaks again to all sorts of little gods' heresy. As seen in the other traditions discussed, God is presented as a force rather than as a father, and judgment and hell are largely non-existent. In this Gnostic tradition. Now that we have a base understanding of the corrupt overlapping beliefs in the occult system, we can list out the 13 key pieces of leaven that we see again and again. Wolves in sheep clothing enter into the church and attempt to indoctrinate us with the following. Number one, they attempt to elevate man. This is very similar to what we see in the beginning with Satan wanting to have his throne up to be like the Most High God. Number two, downsizing God. On the same vein of thought, in order for one to pretend to be equal to God, they must elevate themselves or bring God down. Occultists attempt to do both through subtle doctrine. Number three, God as a force and not as a father. We see this again and again and again in occult tradition after occult tradition and this leaven has entered the church as well. Uh, number four, many paths, or a broader path, to salvation. We know that Jesus is the only way. Occultists try and broaden things up, and one way to do that is for them to state that Jesus is the only way, but then they show that there are many ways to follow Jesus and to know Jesus, and so they try to broaden the doctrine on the other side. Number five, self-help instead of self-denial. Occultists are all about uplifting themselves through carnal efforts instead of submitting to God and giving Him our burden that He can mold us into someone new. Number six is hidden knowledge. While we as Christians should endeavor to know nothing except Christ crucified, that same poison carrot that the snake dangled in front of Eve in the garden, the temptation of forbidden knowledge is very rampant amongst the teaching of wolves. Number seven, a de-emphasis on sin. We saw again and again and again in these different traditions that sin is either minimized or even made to be something that's gray and cannot be told good from evil. Number eight, little to no judgment. Along the same vein of thought, when you can minimize sin, then the judgment for God that comes in regards to sin if you have not repented and received Jesus Christ is also minimized. Number nine, God's wrath is greatly downplayed. 
it's ignored in these traditions, and even though it's a very prominent part of the Bible, his holy and righteous wrath and judgment upon the nations, both in this world and in the age to come, his wrath and his judgment that is poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth and the unfaithful angels from heaven is largely ignored. And so you will see these wolves uh, downplaying it, or sometimes they just avoid talking about it or talk about as little as possible. Number 10, hell or the lake of fire is greatly minimized by these wolves. Again, it's something that they just won't talk about much or they will minimize it or using one of the other uh, tactics, they'll try to make it more of a human state and take God out of it, separate God from it completely. Number 10, moral ambiguity. God has very clear standards for conduct. He identifies many sins. He identifies behavior that is righteous. But these wolves, they're going to minimize, talk about right and wrong, righteousness and sin. Number 12, oneness and brotherhood without division. This is another well-hidden piece of leaven because it is true that we are all one in Christ. There is no Jew nor Greek, male nor female, free nor bond, but all are one in Christ. However, this follows a very important division between the sheep and the goats. Jesus did not come to bring peace on earth, but to bring a sword to cut and divide even families. And so this part, of course, is taken out from the wolves, and they speak more about the brotherhood of men, of all men, of all beliefs and traditions, rather than oneness in Christ. Number 13, strange doctrines. So in order to support all the above pieces of leaven, they oftentimes have to invent these strange and new ways of looking at and interpreting scripture where they really take things out of context to be able to twist it to fit these various pieces of leaven into what they are teaching. And for those who are not well versed in the Bible and who are not close to the Holy Spirit, it's very easy uh, to fall into this trap. Now, I want you to notice what is missing. The above items do not include any obstructions about Jesus' love for us, nor the fact that he died for our sins. Wolves in sheep's clothing are free to talk about this all they want, while secretly inserting their other pieces of leaven. Sometimes they go overboard in emphasizing the love of Christ in order to take the congregation's attention off of other passages that would otherwise expose their leaven. Indeed, if a wolf failed to talk about the love and sacrifice of Jesus, they would be easily discerned as false. Some would argue that since these wolves teach that Jesus loved us and died for our sins, that the other leaven is okay, because that is all we need for salvation. However, as usual, the devil is in the details. We must believe in Jesus to be saved, the true Jesus. If a wolf can get you to put your faith in his corrupt, fake version of Jesus instead, then you'll be damned unless you repent. Remember, the scriptures warn that many false Christs will come. Indeed, these false Christs are being taught from the pulpit today. If you are following a Jesus who takes the spotlight off of God in order to shine it on man, then you are not following the Jesus of scriptures. If you are following a Jesus who never preaches against sin and offers a broad path to salvation, then you are not following the Jesus of the Bible. If you are following a Jesus who introduces strange new doctrines in an effort to avoid and downplay God's judgment, wrath, and punishment, then you are not following the Jesus of the Bible. The devil doesn't need to get you to stop following the name of Jesus. He just needs to get you to stop following the true Jesus. The preferred place that the devil can get a person is where they think they're in the sheepfold, but in reality, the good shepherd has never known them. As you can see, a wolf in sheep's clothing can still preach many truths. In fact, they will endeavor to teach as accurately as possible with the exception of these 13 identified points and perhaps others in order to sound authentic and earn people's trust. They could even give entire sermons that are legitimate. Their goal is to mold you in time into being an individual whose understanding of Jesus is twisted just enough to fit their teachings. The best way to recognize a wolf is to look for these points of leaven being slipped into their doctrine. This is how we can discern the difference between a wolf and a sincere Christian who simply has minor doctrinal differences. Nobody is perfect and each of us can only know that which God has revealed to us. For this reason, many dismiss the red flag 
teachings of a wolf in sheep's clothing, believing they can chew the meat and spit out the bones. However, now you know better. If you see the warning signs that we have talked about surfacing, you'll be able to discern the wolf. Keep in mind, too, that some people are not wolves themselves, but merely confused individuals who are paired in the things that a wolf has tricked them into believing. Either way, we should reject their teaching, but be sure to treat everyone with love and to not assume the worst of them. I speak this in regards to the deceived. If someone has shown themselves to be a wolf, we do not owe them polite private messages asking them to please stop leading people into the pits of hell. Jesus publicly reprimanded the wicked Pharisees and called them hypocrites, blind leaders of the blind, and children of the devil. Not only Jesus, but John the Baptist also called them vipers. The Lord has sent me to feed his sheep, so I am here to help those precious lambs who have been sullied by these destructive wolves. I am not sent to reason with the bloodthirsty beast who fleece the flock. Before we look at some real-world examples, many of you might be wondering the question of why. A wolf in sheep's clothing knows it's a wolf and knows what it is doing. Why would anyone ever choose to deliberately mislead people to their doom while simultaneously sealing their own? The most important thing is to first establish what is happening before we are concerned with the why. I've seen far too many people turn away from the plain truth right in front of their face because they make the mistake of jumping to the why, and then if they're unable to understand the why, they dismiss the what. The plain truth is that it is happening. There are wolves that are purposefully misleading millions of people. This is written in the scriptures. This was prophesied many times by Jesus and by the apostles going back thousands of years that wolves would enter into the flock and that they would bring doctrines of demons and men and that pastors would preach sermons to people who have itching ears that want to hear smooth things. A lot of sheep today, thank you, Father, are waking up to this leaven. The reason why people do it can be varied. Some people really are servants of the devil, truly believing that he will reward them in some worthwhile way. Others might start off well but become corrupted by fame and fortune. With fame comes pride, and pride is a powerful destroyer of men, while the love of money is the root of all evil. When someone grows in influence and prestige, the secret societies are bound to move in. The discerning eye can sometimes pinpoint when someone has sold out by the change in their teachings. None of this should come as a surprise to us, nor be dismissed as unfounded conspiracy. The scriptures tell us who the God, lowercase g, of this world is. They also tell us that the entire world is under the power of the evil one. And this was written thousands of years before the prince of the power of the air literally had control of what is shown on the airwaves. Many sheep are waking up to the reality of this world and are starting to notice what time it is. Praise Jesus for that. So let's look at some real world examples of this wolf's leaven in action. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man and everything produces after its own kind, if horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. And, and, and I'm really coming with a humble heart saying, I actually don't know why you didn't intervene. And I, I'm having an honest conversation with God. And I'm saying, I'm, I'm letting you use your all-knowingness now. I'm opening my heart and I'm saying, use your all-knowingness in me. Know my heart. David said it this way, know my heart and search my, my ways. If you see anything wicked in there, huh, go ahead and take it out. I just realized that God actually needs permission to do that because he relegates his all-knowingness to my will when it comes to my life. And God goes, I would love to know you, but I'm waiting for you to invite me in so I can see what's happening inside of you. It's not how God sees you that determines where your life ends up. If it had been, Moses wouldn't have died in the wilderness. It's not how God sees me. It's how I think God sees me that determines where I end up. 
has the power to take life, but he can't. He got the power to do it, but he won't. He's bound. He can't. He says death and life is in the power of whose tongue? Yours. You ready for this? You want something that'll knock your lights off? You choose when you live. You choose when you die. The power of God was in Jesus. The healing power of God. The restoring power of God. The same power that made demons flee was in Nazareth, but Jesus could not release it because it was trapped in their unbelief. And there's one thing that even Jesus can't do. One thing that even the Son of God can't do. Even Jesus cannot override your unbelief. I see y'all looking at me like, is that true? Thought he could do anything. He said he could not. He wanted to. He was prepared to. He was able to. And he couldn't. The power of God was in Nazareth, but it was trapped in their perspective. I want to talk to you today about staying positive toward yourself. The most important relationship you have is the relationship with yourself. Too many people don't like who they are. Now, God needs someone that he can partner with in the earth. In fact, when he said, let them have dominion, he transferred dominion, rulership, and reign over to mankind. And so it's illegal for God to do anything in the earth without someone. So that's why God is standing, looking to and fro for somebody to make up the hedge. You better slap somebody and say, you've got a big job for Jesus. All right, so how did you do? That should have been some of the more easy leaven to pick out. In fact, anytime you can just show a quick sound bite and it's right there in the open, it's going to be easier to discern. And most of these were around points one and two, where they are trying to question or diminish the sovereignty of God while elevating that of man. And that's uh, one of the most common ones that you will see. Uh, done probably the most common leaven that's being put into the church, and it's a deadly one. I mean, understand, you have to have the right relationship with God. A prideful person who thinks that God is dependent on them is not going to strut into heaven on the day of judgment and have a place found there. We have to be very humble and understand that we are completely dependent on God for everything. Every breath we take is a gift from God. He decides when we're born. He decides when we take our last breath. And the only thing that matters is what he thinks of us. God is perfect and holy and complete on his own. Prior to completing man, he was lacking of nothing. It is a wonderful honor and privilege that God calls on us to, to serve, to be able to serve him. It's such a privilege to be able to worship him, to praise him to pray to him and for him to hear our prayers. It's a wonderful privilege. He does not need us. He is not dependent on us. It's completely the other way around. We are dependent on him for everything, all power, all holiness, all glory, all thanks to God forever in the name of Jesus Christ. That is the correct understanding of our relationship with God, and you can probably tell the the words I'm speaking are really the opposite spirit of what you saw in these clips that I played. Um, and so I want to dive into this a little bit deeper because I think a lot of you could recognize that leaven very easily. You might have recognized some of the individuals you saw there uh, as wolves, but it can be more difficult to discern than those little clips there. Sometimes you can't discern it from one clip. You have to look at the full teaching or you have to even look at a collection of teachings to see what they are talking about and what they are not talking about. And you know, I'll just give you an example here so you can understand what I'm driving at. Suppose I was uh, teaching someone who didn't know anything about Jesus. They just heard about him. And I uh, read some Bible verses to them because they want to understand how many people will be saved. And suppose and I read the Bible verses to them that say it's the will of God that all be saved. And I read the Bible verse that talks about how Jesus died for the sins of everyone. And I read the Bible verse about how great and bountiful God's mercy is. And then I just stop there. 
okay, that individual not having any other knowledge of scriptures might come to the conclusion that everyone is saved, or certainly most people are. Um, that's because in this example I'm given, I didn't mention the verse about it being a narrow path and few who find it, whereas the path that leads to destruction is broad and there are many who go in that way. And so we know that the majority of people are not going to turn to Jesus to, to submit to him, to receive his grace and to be saved. And so that's obvious from the scriptures. If you read all the scriptures and you teach the fullness of that subject, but you can see how by just cherry picking specific scriptures, you could actually create uh, a viewpoint that's false. You could lead someone to believe differently than what the reality is. And so that's why, just like when you read the Bible, it's important to, to understand all the scriptures to get the complete picture. Uh, same thing with teachers. You know, you have to look at not just what they're saying and, okay, is that correct? Are they quoting from the Bible? But are there some things that they're not saying? Are there things that they're really going out of their way to not say? And so when you take this list of 13 11 points, that's what's really going to help you to drive that home because you can hone in on those specific subjects and see, hmm, this individual really seems to be avoiding talking about, you know, point six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, and however many of them on there, you'll start to see the, the leaven by what they won't talk about or what they uh, diminish talking about, minimize how much they talk about. Some individuals have even built entire ministries based on one particular point of leaven. And so let's briefly overview some of the more prominent ones. So the first one that comes to mind is prosperity gospel. And so this is the teaching that Faith expressed through positive thoughts, positive declarations, and donations to the church draw health, wealth, and happiness into believers' lives. It's also referred to as the health and wealth gospel, the name it and claim it gospel. Central to this teaching are beliefs that salvation through Jesus Christ includes liberation from not only death and eternal damnation, but also poverty, sickness, and other ills. And so before we talk about what's wrong with what it teaches, it's what it doesn't teach that really stands out. So a prosperity gospel preacher is not likely to preach about persecution, about picking up your cross and following after Jesus, about how because the world hated him first, it will hate you. These teachers uh, don't teach about the poverty that Jesus faced, the persecution that Jesus and all of his followers faced, and instead it very much focuses on the individual person instead of on God, about your desires and, and your dreams and praying for God to grant it. And it really puts the person as the central figure and makes God in the supporting role who's here to, to bless you with the things that you want. And the worst part about it is the blessings are often materialistically based. So we're not talking about people reaching out to God in the fullness of their heart. Uh, asking your will, not my will, Father, and people saying, I'm the clay, you're the potter, please shape me according to, to your desires, and people uh, asking for the kinds of blessings that lead to treasure in heaven, it's much more uh, carnally uh, based. And so that, that's the problem. And when you look at the 13 points of Wolf Levin, again, it centralizes man, uh, it downsizes God, it's all about self-help instead of self-denial. It de-emphasizes sin because it's focused not on uh, correcting things about us that are not pleasing to God. It's all about changing our lives, changing things in our lives that are not pleasing to us. You see how it completely reverses the dynamic that we should be focused on first and foremost. And of course, this type of gospel, it doesn't talk much about judgment and God's wrath. It's only about his blessing. And so it just, uh, it incorporates a whole bunch of these 11 points that we see are very prominent pillars of these corrupt mystery school belief systems that are really being brought into the church under the guise of a, an approach to Christianity. But it's really a, an approach that's taking people away from Christianity. It's mixing two schools of thought. It's trying to mix the salt water and the fresh water, which cannot be done. Uh, another one is the Word of Faith movement, and so it might mean different things to different people. 
uh, at the heart of the Word of Faith movement is the belief and the force of faith. And so right off the bat, we have that, you know, God almost as a force rather than a father or the force, the power of God, the power of faith being put above God. Um, and, you know, and to go on, uh, many people in this movement um, believe that the laws that are behind this supposed faith force, as they put it, are said to operate independently of God's sovereign will, and so that God himself is subject to these laws. And so they're putting God, the giver of the laws, as if he is below the laws himself. It's as if the pot is greater than the potter, as if the, uh, the wonderful things, the wonderful blessings that come from God, which includes faith and righteousness and his judgment, even his wrath is righteous. Um, all the things that come out of God, they're a product of him. He is, he is great. He is worthy to be praised. But when you take uh, his power and you make it as if the power itself is greater than God, uh, not only is that a heresy, but you can see how clearly this ties into all these mystery school practices that I showed you at the beginning. I mean, this isn't just someone misunderstanding Christianity. This is taking anti-Christian, Luciferian religious principles and trying to meld it with Christianity. So it's very dangerous. And when you talk about this idea of, of using this faith force as if faith is a, a force that can be wielded by the individual, not God's sovereignty, but this force is what the focus is on. Uh, it's very similar to what you see in the Star Wars movies. And people don't realize that those are actually very uh, occultic in their nature and their meaning. And it actually lines up with these mystery school religions, as you can see. And so I, I, I look at the stuff in the world that people think, oh, well, it's just mindless entertainment. And I see that there's a message behind it. There's indoctrination behind everything. Uh, everything in Hollywood is programming. And, you know, it ruins movies for you in a good way when you figure that out, that it's just programming and you don't want to be subjected to it anymore. But as you start to understand these points of leaven, you'll start to see it uh, in many, many places so intricately threaded throughout all of our society and uh, it's so overt and so ubiquitous it would almost be laughable if it weren't such a serious matter because there really is a battle going on in the spiritual realm for the souls of men leaven isn't always easy to see uh, i remember the first teaching i heard after becoming a christian a very prominent and popular teacher was talking about l in the lake of fire and he said that it is created by man for man and he went on to assert that whatever hell is, God has nothing to do with it. And of course, this is false. The scriptures clearly affirm that God created the lake of fire as a place of his wrath for the unfaithful angels. And it's Jesus who all judgment has been given to who will decide who goes there ultimately. So the lake of fire was neither created by man nor for man. What is most disturbing about this teaching is that this person knows better. This individual knows the Bible really well, and so it begs the question of why he was laboring so hard to try and create this new dichotomy. And so most people dismiss this strange teaching as an unimportant doctrinal difference. After all, we are saved by faith in Christ, not faith in nor knowledge of hell. The reason I will not overlook it is because it checks the majority of the 13 boxes of wolf leaven. It makes man bigger and God smaller. It diminishes God's righteous judgment by attempting to divorce him from the single biggest judgment decision in history. It downplays God's wrath and minimizes hell since the lake of fire is the ultimate carrying out of God's wrath. It de-emphasizes sin since the single biggest consequence of unrepentant sin, the lake of fire, is attempted here to be severed from God's wrath. It also qualifies as a strange new doctrine. This single teaching hits on seven of the 13 points I've categorized from corrupt mystery school teachings. And so if you apply these principles that I'm teaching, you will start to see the leaven more often. It is not my intent to steer you away from anyone. My only intent is to share knowledge and understanding of how wolves operate so you can better discern their leaven on your own. What you do with the knowledge is between you and the Lord. We'll pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth in Jesus' mighty name. Until the next time, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you.